In the quiet recesses of time, where the echoes of an ancient people linger, we find ourselves drawn to the enigma that is the Aurignacian people. The ancient winds whisper their tales across the landscapes of Ice Age Europe, where this mysterious culture once thrived. As we step into the folds of history, let us unravel the tapestry of their existence, a journey that transcends the boundaries of prehistoric epochs. It is generally accepted that they came from the Caucasus region, but could they have originated elsewhere completely that would never have been acknowledged by the mainstream narrative? Welcome to Alternative Notions where we delve into various topics and ask critical unorthodox questions to expand the mind. As we peel back the layers of antiquity, seeking the threads that bind us to the enigmatic legacy of the Aurignacians. We will go through a variety of books and journals that give their opinions on where these founding fathers of ancient Europe originated from. From the book Melchizedek and the Temple, The Promise of the Ages. From various histories, we find a greater antiquity to cultural diffusions and from a different region than what has been believed. The Pelasgians were only one of a number of races that carried with them the cultural traits of the Atlanteans. Prior to their arrival, we find the Cro-Magnon migrating from Atlantis and arriving in Europe nearly 25,000 years ago. They were a tremendously gifted race whose art has been given the term Aurignacian. In referring to them, Professor Osborne states that they were the Paleolithic Greeks. Artistic observation and representation and a true sense of proportion and of beauty were instinctive with them from the beginning. Their arrival in Europe coincides with the ending of the last ice age with the greatest extent of their settlements being on the Biscay coast, the Pyrenean region and Dordogne. These migrations occurred when Atlantis began to experience violent upheavals and partial disruptions of their empire, forcing them to find new lands. The Cro-Magnon race may be considered as being the ancestors of some of the present-day Native American races. From cave paintings we find evidence that the Cro-Magnon people were reddish-brown in color while skeletons found from the continent of America to the Strait of Magellan reveal features resembling both the Red Indians and the Cro-Magnon Atlanteans. We find as well the beginning of the system of preserving the dead, which later developed into mummification. The Cro-Magnon skeletons are found painted red, the color of life, a color symbolically used throughout the ages to denote supreme power, glory, and triumph. The Minoans were called the Red Ones by the Egyptians while the ancient pharaohs themselves were depicted with red skin. The word Phoenician is based directly on the Greek for red while the word Adam used in scripture is taken from the word Adama, meaning the red, or red earth. Quoted from Wikipedia. The red paint people are a pre-Columbian culture indigenous to the New England and Atlantic Canada regions of North America. They were named after their burials, which used large quantities of ochre, normally red, to cover both the bodies of the dead and grave goods. Sometimes they are known as the Moorhead phase of the Laurentian tradition or the Moorhead burial tradition after Warren K. Moorhead who brought them widely to the attention of scientists. They flourished between 3000 BCE and 1000 BCE. Alternatively, they can be called by the period in which they lived, either the Maritime Archaic, emphasizing a coastal and seafaring culture, or Late Archaic, emphasizing time and leaving open the possibility of living inland seasonally although these terms often cover the longer period from 7000 BCE to 1000 CE. Multiple hypotheses exist as to which if any later peoples might be their descendants and there is little archaeological evidence to support any hypothesis. Their burial culture was more elaborate than any subsequent culture in the area. In the southern portion of their range, they were succeeded by the Suscana culture which used pottery, and no evidence of their stoneworking techniques is found in that culture. From Journal de la Société des Americanists, titled Red Paint. A skull and other human bones, probably Aurignacian, discovered with traces of red on them were at first considered to have been directly painted by man. From the book The Problem of Atlantis, if we imagine the continental mass of Atlantis slowly disintegrating during the Ice Age, we must admit that its gradual breakup would have given rise to repeated immigrations, or to invasions of Europe during a prolonged period of time. Plato gives the date of the destruction of Atlantis at 9,000 years before Solon's day, or about 9600 BC, but it is probable that men were making their way from the partially wrecked continent into Europe many thousands of years before that date, although one of those migratory impulses chanced to synchronize with the precise period he mentions. But I shall try to adduce evidence that the first of these migrations did not reach Europe by sea, but by dry land, and that Europe at the time of its entrance was still in places joined to the now sunken continent of Atlantis. The migrating race I speak of is known to archaeologists as the Cro-Magnon, or Aurignacian, from the circumstance that one of the earliest discoveries of its peculiar culture was made by Emile Artet, a French anthropologist, in a grotto hard by the little hamlet of Cro-Magnon, near Les Az, on the Vezir, where he found five skeletons which have come to be regarded as the type of the great Cro-Magnon race. Prior to this, similar remains were discovered in 1852 in the sepulchral grotto of Aurignac from which locality the especial culture of this people came to be known as Aurignacian. 
Attempts have been made to differentiate between the racial character of these finds, but without success. Anthropologists at once remarked upon the extraordinary height and brain capacity of the newly found Cro-Magnon race. Broca noted that the brain content of the skull of a Cro-Magnon woman surpassed that of the average male of today. The average height of the men of this race was 6 feet 1 inches. The shoulders were exceedingly broad, and the arms short as compared with the legs, an indication of high racial development. The nose was thin, but prominent, the cheekbones high, the chin massive. Sir Arthur Keith remarks that this race was one of the finest mentally and physically the world has ever seen. When the Cro-Magnon race arrived in the Biscay region of Europe at the close of the Ice Age, which came to an end about 25,000 years ago, they found the continent sparsely inhabited by a subvariety of the human species which did not at all approach it in physique or ability. This was Neanderthal man, a creature almost human, who had developed the art of making rough stone tools. But he was of a low and plantigrade type, scarcely differentiated in some ways from the higher apes, unable to grasp the tools or weapons he fashioned as might modern man. Also, he was hampered by a relatively small brain capacity. He speedily retreated before the superior skill and strength of the Cro-Magnons, who, little by little, dispossessed him of the soil of Europe, so that in the end he became extinct. Now such burying places of the Cro-Magnons as have been discovered reveal new and extraordinary conditions. The graves of this race are full of flints, pebbles, perforated shells, teeth, and other charms, and amulets. Shells are particularly numerous, and some of them seem to have been made into mantles or gorgets, which had covered the whole or part of the body. On the walls of the caverns where those burials took place are imprints of human hands which had been laid on the rock and then dusted round with colored earth. In many cases it is plain that one or more finger joints of the left hand had been cut off. The practice was analogous to that of some present-day African bushmen, Australian blackfellows, and some American Indian tribes who practice finger mutilation. This is done on the death of a relative, the intention being to cut off deaths, that is, to sacrifice a part of the body to save the whole. We shall see later that the Aztecs of Mexico left the imprints of the hands of their sacrificial victims on the door jams of the heroes who had taken them prisoners in battle. In some cases traces of red paint are found on the bones of the Cro-Magnon remains, and this implies that red ochre, ruddle, or some other red earth was rubbed on the body after death to give it the color of blood, that is of life, to restore to it the hues of life, to bestow these hues in abundance, in the hope that one day it might resume existence, and shake off the heavy sleep into which it seemed to have fallen, or enjoy a healthy and natural life in another sphere. From the book Day of the Fish. To the Dogon, mitochondrial Eve was known as Leba and she was symbolized by the lion. I believe that figure 3-1, which is a lion ivory mammoth sculpture, thought to be the world's oldest known animal-shaped image, symbolizes Leba. This figure, which is about 32,000 years old, gives human characteristics to the lion, and comes from the Aurignacian culture. It was found in a cave in Swabian Alb, Germany. This sculpture was originally identified as the Lion Man but was more recently redefined as the Lion Lady. According to conventional radiocarbon dating, the Aurignacian culture existed from 45,000 to 35,000 years ago in Europe and Southwest Asia. The most recent calibration of the radiocarbon time scale indicates that the Aurignacian culture may be even older existing within the period from about 47,000 to 41,000 years ago. The name of the culture originates from the main site of Aurignac in the Haute-Garonne area of France. The Aurignacian culture has been called the first modern humans in Europe. Anthropologists also found a similar but smaller, lion-headed sculpture, along with other animal figures and several flutes, in another cave in the same region of Germany. This find led them to speculate that the lion figure may have played an important role in the mythology of humans of the early Upper Paleolithic. In the Encyclopedia of Occultism and Parapsychology Volume 2. Until a few centuries ago, most people lived in what they considered a magical universe, and evidence of the practice of magic is found as far back as human prehistory. Among the earliest traces of magic practice are paintings found in the European caves of the Middle Paleolithic period. These belong to the last interglacial period of the Pleistocene epoch, named the Aurignacian after the cave dwellers of Aurignac, southern France, whose skeletons, artifacts, and drawings link them with the Bushmen of South Africa. In the cave of Gurgas, near Bagnères de Lachon, there are, in addition to spirited and realistic drawings of animals, numerous imprints of human hands in various stages of mutilation. Some hands were apparently first smeared with a sticky substance and then pressed onto the rock, others were held in position to be dusted around with red ochre or black pigment. Most of the imprinted hands have mutilated fingers, in some cases the first and second joints of one or more fingers are missing, in others only the stumps of all fingers remain. These Aurignacians might also be identified as carriers of the Mediterranean as well as Negroid, i.e., generalized African, 
Skullvari Hutton, 1930, identified among Native Americans. More than 30, elapsed between the arrival of anatomically modern humans in Siberia departure of Paleo-Indian ancestors from Beringia. That is certainly enough localized anatomical variants to have developed in relative isolation, on thrown together again when people migrated and regrouped in response to Pleistocene climate and vegetation changes, Sarek 1997. The extra variability of the Thu County and Upper Cave population at CA. 12 to 13,000 seems to bear witness to such a process. In the thesis The Colonization of Australia Prior to European Settlement, it states the following. Salas had previously suggested that the cave paintings resembled the Aurignacian people's work, and that the Juan Ginas may have been the remnants of these people's existence. In the book Melanesians and Australians and the Peopling of America, it states the following. It is understood that there can be no question of direct race relation. This is excluded not only by the spatial conditions, but also by the physical characteristics of the living. We have here not related races but similar phylogenetic phases. The so-called Australomorphous hominid stage is found in Old Europe as the Aurignacian race, in South Africa as the Cape Flats race, in Australia as the Australians, and finally also in the coast type of Brazil. The craniometric evidence for SSA populations in Europe was also examined by Brace et al. 2006, after studying 24 craniofacial measurements of AMH from Europe was surprised to find that Neolithic people in Europe fail to be related to modern Europeans. Some researchers have assumed that the Basque, a non-Indo-European population in Spain probably represented descendants of the original Europeans, but samples from this group and Canary Islanders did not correspond to the Natchvians or Cro-Magnon populations, Brace, 2006. The founders of civilization in Southwest Asia were the people, archaeologists call Natchvians. By 13,000 BC, according to Clark, 1977, the Natchvians were collecting grasses in Nubia, Eret, 1979, which later became domesticated crops in Southwest Asia. In Palestine the Natchvians established intensive grass collection. The Natchvians used the ibero morusian tool industry, Wendorf, 1968. The Aurignacian civilization was founded by the Cro-Magnon people who originated in Iberia. They took this culture to Western Europe across the Straits of Gibraltar, Winters, 2011. The Cro-Magnon people were probably Bushmen slash Khoisan, Bull and Valois, 1957. The classic Aurignacian culture probably began in Africa, crossed the Straits of Gibraltar into Iberia, and expanded eastward across Europe, Brown, 2006, Gilead, 2005, Stephen et al., 2001, Winters, 2008, 2011. The archaeological record informs us that Cro-Magnon people replaced the Neanderthal population of the Levant, at Kassar Akil around 32,000 years ago, Stephen et al., 2001, Gilead, 2005, not the Natchvians who entered the Levant almost 20,000 years later. This indicates that the Aurignacians moved west to east from Iberia across Europe. The archaeological and craniometric evidence indicates that the pre-Indo-European people were probably highly pigmented. There have been numerous Negroid skeletons found in Europe according to Boole and Valois, 1957. Diop, 1991, discuss the Negroes of Europe in civilization or barbarism, pages 25 to 68. Also W.E.B. Dubois, the world in Africa noted that there was once a an uninterrupted belt of Negro culture from Central Europe to South Africa, p. 88. Boole and Valois, 1957, reported the find of SSA skeletons at Grotte des Enfants, chain blands in Switzerland, several Ligurian and Lombard tombs of the Metal Ages have also yielded evidences of a Negroid element. Since the publication of Verno's memoir, discoveries of other Negroid skeletons in Neolithic levels in Illyria and the Balkans have been announced. The prehistoric statues, dating from the Copper Age, from Sultan Sello the evidence makes it clear that the first Europeans were dark-skinned. Alalda et al. 2014, provides conclusive genetic evidence that hunter-gatherers in Mesolithic Europe were dark-skinned or highly pigmented with light, blue, eyes. The Alalda et al. 2014, study of La Brana Arantero site in Leon, Spain of dark-skinned hunter-gatherer Europeans corresponds to the Lochper sample from Luxembourg, of dark-skinned Europeans. This kind of pigmentation in Western Eurasia appears to be associated with Cro-Magnon man, the first human in Western Europe who was associated with the Aurignacian culture. The first AMH European reconstructed by forensic artist Richard Neve, of National Geographic from 35 Kia resembled a Khoisan individual. This supports the research of Boole and Valois, 1957, that South Africans migrated across Africa, into Europe over 35 Kia. Most researchers maintain that the first AMH European came from the Levant. This migration of AMH entering Western Eurasia from the east is not supported by the archaeological evidence.
the Oregonian culture, which is associated with the Cro-Magnon people, crossed the Straits of Gibraltar (SG) from Africa into Iberia. Winters, 2008, 2011. We know that the first AMH probably entered Western Eurasia via the SG, because Neanderthals dominated the Levant until around 30 to 20 Kia. Between 10 to 5 Kia, the Levant population was tropically adapted hominids, especially in relation to Kof's school, QS hominids, holiday, 2000. 95% of the QS population were SSA. For example, Kofs A8 at 85% and Skull 4 at 71%. Holiday 2000. The fauna and zooarchaeological remains from QS indicate the hominids here exploited African fauna. Holiday 2000. Holiday 2000 claims the QS people were proto-cromagnons because they were similar in dental and craniological size to the Oregonian hominids. Holiday 2000. Except of the AMH and QS, the majority of hominids in the Levant were Neanderthal. Numerous sub-Saharan skeletons have been found in Europe dating to the Oregonian and Neolithic periods. Brace et al. 2006, Boul and Valois, 1957, Diop, 1974, 1991, Dubois, 1941, Boul and Valois, 1957, observed that sub-Saharan skeletons have been found in the Ligurian and Lombard tombs. Grotte des Enfants. Chamblands in Switzerland, caverns of Monyat near Dinan in Belgium. Boul and Valois, 1957, claim that these European farmers correspond to the Khoisan population. This is interesting because Brace et al. 2006 found that the craniofacial features of these early European farmers and the Natchfians plotted with sub-Saharan groups. Brace et al. 2006, just like the Oregonians, Boul and Valois, 1957, Winters, 2011. Scogland et al. 2014 investigated the pigmentation of ancient Europeans including skeletal remains from Ivy to 5, La Brana 1, and the Iceman. The analysis by Scogland et al. 2014 determined that the pigmentation phenotype for these Europeans was dark skin. There are NHGS found in Africa. Haplo groups N N and N1 is found in low frequencies within sub-Saharan groups including Senegambians, Gonzales et al. 2006 Tanzanians, Gonder et al. 2006, and modern Ethiopians, Quibtanana Morsi, 1999. In Egypt, 8.8% of the Germa carry HGN1B. Stevanovich et al. 2003. In Egypt, 8.8% of the Germa carry HGN1B. Stevanovich et al. 2003. In Bulgaria, are also thought to portray Negroids. Boul and Valois, 1957. In 1928, Rene Bailly found in one of the caverns of Monyat, near Dinan in Belgium, a human skeleton of whose age it is difficult to be certain, but seems definitely prehistoric. It is remarkable for its Negroid characters, which give it a resemblance to the skeletons from both Grimaldi and Asseller, Diop, 1991. Boul and Valois, 1957, was able to chart the migration of civilization from South Africa to the Oregonian culture of Europe. These anthropologists reported that the Khoisan shared the same style stone implements and burials associated with the Oregonian or Salutrian type industry. Boul and Valois, 1957, pages 318 to 319. They add that in relation to Bushmen, Khoisan, art this almost uninterrupted series leads us to regard the African continent as a center of important migrations which at certain times may have played a great part in the stocking of southern Europe. Finally, We must not forget that the Grimaldi Negroid skeletons show many points of resemblance with the Bushmen, Khoisan, skeletons, Boul and Valois, 1957. Most of the haplogroups groups associated with Eurasian populations are derived from L3M, N. Winters, 2010, has argued that L3M, N. spread across Africa before the out of Africa, UA, event 60 Kia. Researchers have found that Western Eurasians carry some Neanderthal genes. There is little evidence of Neanderthal genes among African populations. An exception to this norm are the Khoisan who share a phylogenetic relationship with Altai Neanderthals. Proofer et al. 2014. The traditional view for the spread of L3M N across Eurasia is that the M and N macro haplogroups groups originated in Western Eurasia and returned to Africa as a result of back migration. The big problem for this theory is that the proposed dates for the origin of haplogroups groups N and M in Western Europe date to a period when these areas were inhabited by Neanderthal people, not AMH. This supports an African origin for L3M N. The craniometric evidence supports a Khoisan presence in Europe during Oregonian times. 
If the Khoisan represent the ancient dark-skinned European population, this reality should be able to be confirmed by genetic research. From Wikipedia, in a genetic study published in Nature in May 2016, the remains of an early Aurignacian individual, Guillet Q1611 from modern-day Belgium, were examined. He belonged to the paternal haplogroup C1A as well as the maternal haplogroup M. More samples were found to be of the haplogroups IJ and even K2A. Some surprising findings are the paternal haplogroup markers of C1A and K2A along with the maternal haplogroup M, all associated with an origin in the Pacific region of Australia and Melanesia. How could Melanesians and Australians have reached Western Europe thousands of years ago? Mainstream sources claim that the haplogroups in the region must have originated in the Middle East or Caucasus as that would be the middle point between the Pacific region and Western Europe. But could the people of the Pacific and Europe have come from another middle point? Some say that it is Africa, and some think it is the Americas. Could they both be true in their own way? What do you think? Of course, this is just an alternative notion. Thanks for watching.